as a university, we are grappling with how to reopen the campus uh, in a safe and healthy way. And many of our decisions are based on directives from city, county, and state leaders. And I'm proud of California's response to this crisis to date. In 2019, we had about $144 billion of economic activity as a result of tourism. These numbers are dramatically hit. Tourism to California, no surprise, is down about 80%. Um, somewhere around 600,000 jobs have been lost already as a result. One bright spot, again, is we have this extraordinary organization, Visit California, that is already um, looking for ways to recover. We will be ready to welcome uh, visitors uh, as soon as soon as it is safe to do so. We have encouraged people to stay safer at home, but in the face of uh, some of the recent civil unrest, we certainly want to respect and honor people's First Amendment rights to be out uh, expressing uh, their, uh, raising their voices and, and speaking out about injustice. We had just uh, received word at the end of last week that um, LA County's request of the governor to allow for uh, certain communities to be able to reopen if they met thresholds um, by the established by the LA County Department of Public Health um, that that request was granted essential businesses that have remained open uh, they've done their best to enforce those practices um, but for other businesses it will be an incredible challenge this is about getting people back to work but ensuring that we are doing it in a way that it's safe nothing will be more devastating to our economy than lifting the stay-at-home order and having a massive recurrence of COVID, recurrence of cases, overwhelming of our healthcare system, and the need to shut everything down and start over again. In terms of how we get there, people should be looking at the guidelines for their own county. As a result of these state, uh, safer at home orders is that we start to see uh, flexible work options as viable in a going forward basis. Shared duties and responsibilities at home as they're both trying to work from home and take care of their kids and make sure their kids are educated. We also need to make sure that um, that there's childcare available in, in our um, in all of our industries to make sure that uh, working parents are able to focus on their work and, uh, and make sure their children are taken care of. We can always do more, and especially in incredibly challenging times like this. How can we reach those future leaders more effectively? When I was serving as United States Ambassador and Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she would often say, if you want to know how a country is doing, look and see how the women are doing. Women's voices weren't just at the table when we're talking about women's issues, but women's voices were at the table when we were talking about any foreign policy issue. I always point to the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Index. It looks at gender parity by country and it evaluates how a country is doing in terms of gender parity in four uh, areas educational attainment, health and mortality, economic participation, and political participation. What they have found is that year after year, the closer that a country is to gender parity in those four areas, the better that country is doing on the scale of GDPs among the nations of the world. We know that uh, women are on the front lines in all areas right now um, as we deal with the COVID crisis. Because we need more women in leadership, um, we, we know that we have to listen to the voices of what women are experiencing. Sometimes it's circumstances like this where leaders are born. It's very important for all of us, especially in these times, to be together. We're all in this together. This is the human race. This is, this is not about men, women, black, white, yellow. It's, it's about the human race. And if we embrace that concept, both in public administration and public policy, we'll go far.